So this morning, amen, this morning we get to experience something that we've been uh, praying about. Actually, it's a part of why we're here, why we have church, why we do ministry here uh, in this context. It's so that people can not only understand the, the, the gospel and make professions of faith, but also as we do baptism, baptism is all about uh, that 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 outward expression of what transformation is taking place on the inside. And so, as you know, we had our VVS uh, two weeks ago, so not last week, the week before. And from our VVS, um, we've had a couple of candidates, but we have one that is going to be baptized this morning. So that that is one thing to, amen? And so we're, we're, we're uh, beyond the moon excited about uh, what's going to take place during this time. And, and what we recognize is that this is an answer prayer in many ways. Uh, something that we've been praying about, but this is why we do what we do. And so um, uh, I'm going to ask my candidate, Miss Mickey, are you ready? Come on, honey. I got you. Give me a hand. All right. I want you to sit right on this tub. Just sit here for one second for me. Say, hey, Mickey. <laughs> So everybody, this is Mickey, and today, what we what we know is that uh, there's a couple of sacraments at, in our church. Uh, one is the Lord's Supper that we take, but also it's baptism. Jesus Himself was baptized by John the Baptist, and so it's an important part of our faith tradition. It's an important part uh, of what we do here and why uh, we make these public professions of faith. Because we're not ashamed of the gospel, amen? Because we know uh, uh, that, that the way, the truth, the life is Jesus Christ. And so when we get to these points and get to these moments, it's such an awe-inspiring thing to come public with our faith. And so, Miss Mickey, what is your profession of faith? What do you, what do you proclaim? Yeah, keep his head a little louder. Jesus is Lord. Amen. <laughs> And so, sister, I want you to know that we are proud of you. Uh, we thank God for you. For all the rest of your days ahead, your, your future and your afterlife is secure, and we are so excited for all the things that God has for you, that God's going to do in your life. God's going to use you in ways that you can't imagine. When we get saved, it doesn't mean that it's the absence of storms, but what it means is that we have a secure foundation and a hope that lasts eternally. And so we thank God for you and what he's going to do in your life. And so right now, I'm going to turn you this way. Let's turn this way just a little bit. All right. I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, who is none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to go down with Jesus and be raised to new life. Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, huh? We got a lot to celebrate this morning, church.
not checking boxes I'm here to worship I'm here to worship you So dust off the cobwebs And clear out my conscience I'm here to worship I'm here to worship you And nothing I'm here to worship you and nothing else. I'm here to worship you and no one else. I'm here to worship you. I'm here to worship you. Let's sing that verse out again. This is not a performance, and I'm not checking boxes. I'm here to worship, and I'm here to worship you. So dust off the cobwebs and clear out my conscience. And I'm here to worship, and I'm here to worship you. And nothing else, I'm here to worship.
God, I just thank you for uh, another opportunity to minister to these, your precious people. God, I pray that you will uh, decrease in me and increase your influence, uh, that you will uh, speak through my vocal cords, think through my mind, God. Let it be none of me and all of you, God. But what I pray is that those under the sound of my voice, those in this room, God, those even watching online, that they'll be able to hear a word behind the word that comes directly from you. And what I pray, God, is that this morning, let me speak with simplicity and understanding so that we can not only hear what we need to hear, but also go and do it. And so, God, I yield myself into your very capable hands, and I thank you in ex I thank you right now, even ahead of time, for what you'll do in this moment. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. All that agree with that say amen, amen, and amen. Man, it's, look, it's too early, y'all, to get me crying early, man. Come on. I hung on. I was like, oof. Ah, okay. So we began a new series uh, last week. Uh, coming off of VBS. And in VBS, if, if you weren't here, our, our theme was Concretes and Cranes, and it was all about building. And what we told the kids was that it, it was teaching them about building your life on the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. And so that's what we talked about. And subsequently, last week, we started a series where we looked at this idea uh, of building our life on the foundation, which is Jesus. Today, I'm going to kind of continue with that theme by kind of giving you a little quick reminder of where we were, and we're going to pick up a couple of things today. Today, I'm going to, t I'm going to talk from the title, uh, Before You Build. Let me hear you say that. Say, Before You Build. Because I think there's some things that we need to consider as we're doing building in our lives. Last week, uh, uh, we started at 1 Corinthians 3, and so I'm going to ask you if you have your Bibles, your smartphones, or whatever, to turn with me to 1 Corinthians 3, chapter 10. I'm going to read just a quick passage of where we were last week, and then we're going to jump to a couple other places to keep your Bible handy, and we'll get to where we need to go. So that's 1 Corinthians 3, starting at verse 10. 1 Corinthians 3, starting at verse 10. And I'm going to be reading it from the New Living Translation. Feel free to follow along with whatever translation you have in front of you. Uh, we'll get to the same place. Amen. So 1 Corinthians 3, 10, I hear some turning. It's the only thing, you don't have real Bibles. I can't hear the pages turning. People are just pushing buttons. But 1 Corinthians 3, 10, and it says this. It says, because of God's grace to me, I've laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. Paul informs us here that on Judgment Day, our work or, or the quality of the work that we have is going to be tested. Now, some people hear this and say, well, what do you mean? Like, I thought if I got saved, if I believed in Jesus, that I'm going to heaven. He says, you're going to be saved if you believe in Jesus. But what we understand from this passage is that there is work for us to do. That there's something for you and I to do. There's a building that should be taking place, and we're a part of the bigger work that God is doing. And what we understand uh, from this is that as we're building something with our lives, as we're doing the things that God has called us to do, there were a couple questions that I asked you last week. The first question was this. I asked you quite simply, what are you building with your life? What are the things that you're building with your life? If you remember, the example I gave you was I talked about going to the beach and seeing people build these really elaborate sandcastles. And I was like, oh, my God, that is great. But to me, it feels like such a waste of time. Because the waves are going to, at some point, the tide is going to roll back in and knock all that stuff down. And the example I gave was, I said, man, well, what if that person spent two years building up a sandcastle only for it to be washed down? We might say, man, that's a waste of time. But if you can see that in the sandcastle, I'm going to ask you to look at your life and ask the same question. Are you spending your time building things that won't matter next year? Are, are we finding ourselves doing all this work and doing all this stuff for things that won't last instead of actually building the things that will? So that was the first question from last week. 
Uh, also, I talked about the fact that uh, I watch probably too much HGTV. Now, I am not a builder. Like, that's not really my deal. I build in Excel and on computers and all of that kind of stuff. But, but what I recognize is as I look at all of those HGTV shows, one thing that, that always happens in most of those when they're doing a renovation or build or whatever is they have to do like a demo or a demolition, right? They don't build over whatever's there. They have to tear it down and then they build back up something new. And so the question I ask you when it came to our lives is this. Are there things that the Holy Spirit needs you to deconstruct in your life so you can build the things that matter? We can't just be focused on building and not recognize that there might be parts that we have to deconstruct. There might need to be things that we need to take down. The personal example I gave last week was I said, me and my wife were talking about some areas of our life and our marriage, we've been married 16 years and we were like, you know what, this one area, man, we need to, I know we've been building, but it's leaning. It's like Tetris, we done took the pieces out, it's doing one of these, you know. And what I recognized, I said, man, there's some areas that we're going to have to tear this down and really build up something that's going to be sustainable that, that really is what we feel God telling us to do. And the cautionary word that I gave you here was, don't be scared, uh, and this is probably bad English, double negative, but, but don't be scared uh, uh, to tear something down because you spend a lot of time building it. If God's telling you, hey, I know you've been spending this time, but this isn't it, it's okay to tear it down and continue on and to build something new. Because you know what I've learned? There's no season of training or preparation that goes unwasted. God knows how to use all of what you've learned for what you're going to build next. And so if you sense God saying, look, I know this is what you planned. I know this is where you thought it was going to go. But we're going to make a hard right here and go in a different direction. You have to be okay with that and trust God if that, if that means deconstructing to go ahead and build what God is telling you to build. In, the, in today's message, I'm going to talk about the area of what we might call or be considered pre-construction. Now, I'm sure Ruben's going to give me a, a, a guide points about everything I say are wrong about building after this since he's in that industry. Uh, but, but I'm going to talk about pre-construction. And, and really what I want to talk about is the, the kind of before you build stuff that we need to discuss. Do you know that when someone sets out to build a house, uh, they have to, and this is a high level, but they need to go to like an architect and get, get blueprints, right? The architect gives them blueprints, and from the blueprints they use that, a builder goes and builds according to the blueprints. And also, uh, once they get the blueprints, the, that, that builder kind of comes up with a plan or a schedule of how they're going to accomplish it, right? When they're going to do it, day one, day ten, whatever it is. We understand that in this process, the builder still has to deal with elements that are outside of their control, right? as we see in our world today, right? Supply chain issues, whatever it is. There's stuff that's outside of their control that they have to deal with as they go and build. So as we build our lives upon the foundation that is Jesus, sometimes we've set people up in church with unrealistic expectations. <laughs> we tell people that, well, you know what? If you go ahead and get saved, you won't have drama, you won't have trouble, you won't have anything. And to be honest, that's, that's not true. And I'm going to kind of unpack a little bit of that here uh, today for you. If you have your Bibles, turn back with me or turn with me now to Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, because I want to show you something here. Before you build or continue to build in your life, there are some things that I believe you should know, uh, especially after we get saved. So Matthew 7, uh, 24, I'm going to read this from the New King James, New King Jimmy. Uh, Matthew 7, 24. All right, Matthew 7, 24, you can put it up, reads as follows. He says, this is Jesus speaking, by the way. He says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Someone say, same storm. Uh, I'm sorry, I caught y'all off guard, my bad. I won't do that like the whole time, but I'm just kind of, I'm a little excited today. So, so repeat after me, say same storm, same storm. Look, I got to say the words for them to repeat it, right? 
Same storm beat up on these two houses. And, and, and you're going to say, well, Pastor, I know the message. I get the point here. When we look at these two houses, one was built on the foundation and one was not, right? One was built on this foundation on the rock. One was not. Okay, we get it. Uh, the one with the foundation was able to withstand the storm. And I believe the reason that it was was because the focus was on the foundation and not on the house. It was all about it was built on this foundation, whereas the other one was just about building the house. And I say that because I like to ask you a question. I'm going to ask it anyway, but I'm just saying. You ever have somebody say, let me ask you a question, and they just did, right? Okay, sorry. I asked a lot of questions. Here's the question. Is the key to what you're building in your life the foundation you're building upon or simply what you're building? Let me ask that again. Is the key to what you're building in your life the foundation you're building upon or simply what you are building? Think about that for a second. Our focus should be on Jesus and not just what we're building. I say, I say. <laughs> Our focus should be on Jesus and not just the fact that we're building something or the thing that we're trying to build. Paul told us this in 1 Corinthians 3, right? He told us that, hey, uh, Jesus is the foundation, and, and I get it. But here's the, 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 the question that's kind of behind what I'm asking and why I ask this question. In the midst of the progress that you're making right now in your life, has your relationship with Jesus taken a back seat? I like it when y'all look at me that way, like y'all want to throw something or like I stepped on your pinky toe or something like that. I mean, I'm just saying. This is the question we have to ask. Because what I recognize is that sometimes we can become so successful. We can do well. And people are like, man, you're really doing it. You're taking steps. You're really going after your dream. But in the process of doing that, our relationship with Jesus can't be secondary. I know. You came to church and thought I was going to ask you something else. Like, did the Braves win last night? They did. Ozuna, Freddie Freeman, the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no. This is what we have to think about. As we go forward, we can't let our relationship with Jesus slip. Because it's interesting. A lot of times what happens is we're so in our quiet time. We're so walking with God, hearing from God. And then it's like once we get a, a start taking, taking steps forward, there's a tendency to sometimes let that slip to go and grab the other stuff that we want to have. Not realizing that that was the key to get to where we've gotten so far. As we go forward, I believe we should work smart. I believe we should work hard as well. And we should build with what God is giving us. Uh, but just as the builder can't build without a blueprint, are we trying to build and failing to check back in with the architect? So I believe as we have that quiet time with God, as we hear from the Holy Spirit, it's like getting a download. It's like him giving us the information we need for this day. It's like him giving us a little more, okay, take this step, go in this direction. And I wonder, do we get in a place where we're still looking at old blueprints, but there's been updates. <laughs> there, there's been modifications. The, the, the plans have changed. And it's funny when I say that because there are some people in this room that will sit and say, yeah, Pastor, I'm glad I was checking in with the architect because I, I told somebody, I remember saying, saying, to saying to somebody, catch this, five years ago, I said, yeah, I'm only going to be in Atlanta for two years, and then I'm going to go here, and I'm going to go there. But, but God knows how to let you believe what you need to believe to get you where he needs you. And then he tells you, no, no, this is why you're really here. This is what we're going to do now. You thought you were just going to be here for this season. You thought it was just going to do, you know, I'm just going to do this for a little bit and then I'll go there. And then he opens up something for you to do that's a part of your purpose, that a, that's a part of what he has for you to do. And I believe the important thing for us is to make sure that we're checking back with the architect. The architect's Jesus, just in case you're not, you know, not following along at home. Just want to make sure be clear somebody's like the architect I didn't even contract anybody you know <laughs> sorry I tell bad jokes too by the way it's all right as we build we will never get to a place where we can build without him as we build we will never get to a place where we can build without him so this is your reminder if you need it to make sure that you're checking in with God as you go because he wants to be an active part of your journey. He wants to walk with you every step of the way. 
an active part of your journey. And if you haven't uh, uh, been connecting with God, been checking in with God, it's time to start again. It's, it's time to, to get back in that quiet time. It's time to get back in prayer. It's time to say, God, what, what do you want me to do today? But you know what? In this passage we just looked at, I think there's something greater that we should recognize. I mentioned that the builders, uh, I mentioned in this passage, that this passage that the builders can't control everything. And one of the things I think about is like the weather, right? You know, a builder can't control the weather. If they say, hey, we have this plan to finish this in, I don't know, 120 days, but it rains for 12 days straight, so they can't lay cement or whatever, you know, that hinders the process. And so, did you notice in what we read that uh, the weather, that, that whether the house was built on the solid foundation or not, that the storms came anyway? The storms came whether it was built on the foundation, right, Ryan? Whether it was built on the sand, the storm came, right? And I say that because one thing we must recognize and be clear about is that we are all going to face storms on this journey called life. I said a little while ago that sometimes we set people up because we say, hey, if you get saved with Jesus, you're never going to have any more problems. But, but that's not true. But also, that is not even what Jesus said. Jesus is like, I didn't say that. They're misquoting me in the media. Uh, go, look at John 16, 33 real quick. Put that up for me. Uh, Look, I was going to say, hit it, Audrey. <laughs> Inside joke. In John 16, 33, look at what Jesus himself says. He said, I told you all this that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many what? Trials and sorrows. But take heart because I have overcome the world. So let me tell you, if, if some person that's in a pulpit or on TV or whatever tells you that, oh, you're saved, you shouldn't have drama, or you shouldn't have, have, have trials, you shouldn't have, have storms, then tell them they're not reading the book. Or better yet, you might just turn it off. That might be the easy thing to do. Because he tells us that there's going to be storms. In the passage, he said these two houses are built, one, one with the foundation one without, but both of them had a storm. It would be different if he said, hey, one's on the foundation and the rain just went right on by. The flood didn't even touch them, right? And we recognize that in reality. When Hurricane Katrina hit, there were saved folks and unsaved folks who both lived in New Orleans, right? So we understand this to be true, but I think the importance is that our life is built on the foundation, which is Jesus. I also love the fact in this passage here, this scripture, that very first line there, it says that we can have peace in him. I love that we can have peace in him because some of us have experienced storms where the reason we can say that we made it is because we found peace in him even in the midst of all the destruction that took place, even in the midst of all the loss that we had, even in the midst of all the hurt. What helped us to make it was the peace that we found in him. If you knew some of the storms that people sitting around you faced, you'd be amazed. If you understood what people that sit by you that are smiling, maybe saying amen, went through, you would be surprised and I'd be doing a disservice once again just to say to you that there's not going to be storms. There's going to be storms that we're going to face. But in the same breath, <laughs> hear me say that we can experience peace in the midst of storms that will surpass all understanding. And in addition to that, no matter how many storms destroy uh, uh, things in your life, that if our life is built on the rock, we're able to rebuild if needed. And we don't have to be completely destroyed or without hope. Let me ask you to turn one more place for me. Turn over to Luke. So, so if you were in Matthew, you got to go over two books to the right. If you're in John, if you did turn to John, you're going to go back one. Luke chapter 6. I'm going to look at one more thing here. One more passage this morning. <clears throat> I, now, I, I say this a lot, but I'm serious. This is like one of my favorites here. This, I'm telling you, this is... He just, Jesus gives like one of my favorite one-liners here. It's just so great. And maybe it's not a one-liner to him. I mean, because they were probably like, oh, Jesus, why you say that? Okay. Uh, Luke 6, 46. I don't know if I said that. Luke 6, 46 uh, from the New King James here. Jesus is speaking once again. This is a parallel passage to what we just read in Matthew, but, but I, I love Luke. It's one of my favorites. Uh, here it is. <clears throat> he says this. He says, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me 
and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against the house and could not shake it before it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing, he is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. Uh, let, let's do it again. Repeat after me. Say same storm. Same storm, same storm right? Same, same storm, two houses uh, uh, that we saw again. Uh, and the key again was building on the foundation. Cool. But the emphasis here, I believe, uh, which highlights something that maybe we overlooked the first time, is in verse 47. Audrey, can you go back to verse 47 for me? Look at 47 once again. He says, whoever comes to me, hears my sayings. Okay, we're hearing from the architect, and what do they do? Does them. So it is about hearing from him, going to God, hearing from him, and then doing it. Going to God, hearing from God, and then doing it. Going to God, hearing from God, and then doing it. It's not just about, oh, I got the greatest revelation if I go sit down and not do it. It's not about, oh, God gave me this incredible idea. Okay, what you doing, playing PlayStation? Don't be laughing at me, lady. It's about hearing from God and then doing it. T to me, when you look at this passage, this is the, the key to both of the things that we saw in both Matthew and Luke. It's taking what we hear and then doing it. Taking what we hear from God and then doing it. But my favorite is, go back to 46, because 46 is just like, come on, Jesus, you ain't had to say that. He's like, well, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? I was like, I was just asking for, you know, I'm sorry, you know. <laughs> we can't miss the fact that uh, when Jesus tells us what to do, we should do it. If I was the, uh, James, I would say we got to be doers of the word, right, and not hearers only. But what we see here is that we can't be the followers of those disciples who only call on the Lord when we're in trouble. We say, Lord, Lord, help me. And he's like, I told you not to go over there so you wouldn't even be in trouble. Okay, but can you help me now? All right. <laughs> no. We have to hear that first time and do it. We have to hear clearly what he's telling to us and go and do it. We have to submit to him and do the very thing that we hear from God as he speaks to us. Simply stated, as you hear God speak to you, uh, don't be like some kids who have selective hearing. My, my, my dad is here today with us, and he, he could attest to the fact that sometimes I had selective hearing. You know, he's like, you know, it's time to clean up, huh? You know, let's go get ice cream. Okay, you know, I heard that. But we shouldn't be that way with God. We shouldn't be at the place that we only hear what we want to hear. But more so, when we hear God speaking to us, we do. He said, Pastor, you said that like 10 times. I did because I wanted to penetrate. Romans 10 says, faith comes by hearing and by hearing. So I figure if I keep saying it, maybe you'll leave this place and say, you know what? I'm finally going to do the thing that God has been telling me to do. I pray as we leave this place that each of us has crystal clear hearing, but also that you'll have the courage to take action. I pray that almost every Sunday just about, because I really know the difference between hearing and doing. And so, what about you? Is there something God's been speaking to you, and even as I'm talking now, you're like, Pastor, I didn't come to hear God tell me and remind me once again of the very thing I know I should be doing. Is there an area where you sense like, man, even I, I try to get away from it, but it keeps popping up. It keeps popping up like I need to take action in this area. Is there a change needed? And, 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 and quite simply, God's giving you at least one step. You might not have the whole thing uh, mapped out and figured out. But he's like, do this, but you still hadn't done that. What are you waiting on? What, what, are, you, what are you waiting for? I believe one of, one of my assignments this morning is to be uh, uh, the little nudge to say, come on, let's go. Let's do the thing that you know you're supposed to do. 
And you know what's cool about this? See, I, I trust so much in the Holy Spirit that I don't have to know what it is that you need to do, but you know. Because as I'm talking, you're like, okay, Pastor, yep, I got it, I got it. I hear you, God. But what I don't want to happen is, uh, you know one of the greatest tragedies that happens on Sundays? We hear exactly what it is we need to hear. And then we go put our notebook in the car or we close up our little smart device or whatever and we just go about our week and don't do it. And then the next Sunday it's like, oh, I still need to do it. And then the next Sunday I still need to do it. Let's do something different today. If there's something specific that you're hearing God tell you to do that, 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 you're, that, that is popping up even as I'm talking right now, I want you to go forward and do it. I want you to take action. And even if you say, well, Pastor, I, I know what I'm supposed to, I know the thing, but I don't even know what step I'll take. I'm going to even challenge you there. Go to God in prayer today and ask him to show you. Show you what you need to do. What is the next step you need to take? And, and let me tell you something. I, I, some, some messages I'm like, you know, like I hadn't been crucified, right? So it's like I can't really talk about that from experience. But, oh, I can talk about this from experience. I'll tell you what happened to me. Uh, January 2007, I'll never forget, uh, me and this lovely lady that I'm married to here, we were sitting at a church service, uh, the church we were going to at the time, and uh, I was frustrated because I was sitting here like, man, I feel this, this call to, to pastor, to preach. And I'm like, I don't even know what to do. I don't have like a mentor. I, I was like, I, I was just mad. I was like, man, I don't know how I'm going to get there. And I remember the pastor at the church in one of those sidebar moments uh, said, he said, if, you, if, if God's been dealing with you to do something, he was like, uh, you got to go to God and ask him to do it. And I remember sitting there like, well, he ain't talking to me because clearly, you know. And he said, if God's called you to preach, you don't need a pulpit. And I was like, man, he's really coming down my road and sitting next to me in the seat talking to me. And so you know what I did? I went home and did it. I went home and I said, okay, God, I know you've put this in my heart because you've confirmed it in all these ways. And I was like, show me what I need to do. At the time, people were all on MySpace. And I didn't really know how to use social media. Great at the time, but we were all on MySpace. And so the Holy Spirit said, uh, said, write a sermon as if you were pastoring a church today. And he said, I want you to just post it. And I thought it was like a, like a personal blog. So like I was saving it, right? And so every week he said, you know, do it. And I was like, well, what do I teach on? I said, okay, I'll start talking about faith. And then I was like, oh, well, faith works by love. So I started teaching. So each week I was just writing like a little message, right? Well, what I didn't know was as I was posting it, everybody I was friends with was able to see it. And so I'm just posting these little, little messages, little sermons, just whatever, just posting these little things I hear every week. And then people started commenting on them. And then I was like, oh. <laughs> halfway embarrassed, but halfway encouraged because people were like, oh, man, this is a blessing. This is da-da-da-da-da. And what I didn't realize then, which I can clearly see now, that uh, as I got better over time refining that, for over a five-year period of every single week doing this, on vacation or whatever it was, God was showing me and preparing me to write sermons was preparing me uh, to be able to, to critique it, to be able to say, okay, no, teaching series, uh, all the different things that I learned. I started going to other people who were already doing this. Hey, could you, could you check this out? Give me some feedback and whatnot. And over that time of preparation, uh, he sent the people that I would need to be able to be here doing what I'm doing now. And I just went home and just prayed and said, God, show me what the next step is. And so since God's not a respecter of persons, I'm confident that if he did it for me, in my context, in my lane or whatever, that he can do the very same thing for you. So if you want to know what's next, if you want to know what's the next step, ask God for yourself and watch him do it. Last thing is this. If it's all about hearing and then doing, if you are here today, and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. Miss, Miss Mickey made her choice and made her decision. Her, her future is secure, but what about you? When I ask this whole question about making your future secure or, or even making Jesus Lord of your life, here's specifically what I'm asking. If you were to die in the next three minutes, five minutes, whatever it is, do you know with certainty that you would be in the presence of Jesus? When you make the decision to believe in him, this is what you're believing. One, that Jesus really did live. That two, he died on the cross for our sins. That he was buried for three days and then he rose again and is sitting at the right hand of the Father. By believing that in your heart, by placing your faith in him, 
One, it gives you access to heaven, right? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So social media and other things say, oh, there's many ways of God. I'm going to stick with Jesus. He says, I'm the only way. So by placing your faith in him is what gets you saved. But I also believe, as we talked about building and the architect, there's so much more to it than just getting saved. I often emphasize this point because as a kid, I grew up in church all these years uh, when, I was, when I was young and through high school and stuff, and I thought it was just about getting saved and then, you know, don't drink, smoke, or chew, or run around with those who do, that kind of a thing. But then I realized, no, God has more for me to do outside of just getting saved. And so instead of that being the finish line, it is almost like the, the open door that you start off with on this amazing journey with him. And if you can't say that I know I'm saved, if you can't say that I know uh, when I die I'm going to go to heaven, you need to make that decision today. When I ask you that decision, it's not about church. It's not about re religion. It's about a, a true relationship with the one who created you, who knows you better than you know yourself. So in a moment, we're going we're gonna to be standing, we're going to sing and all of that good stuff. Our prayer counselor is going to come. And, and, and at that time, if you need to make that decision, you come and make that decision. Second, if you need to rededicate. Rededication is for those who simply say, you know, Pastor, I've already made that decision to place my faith in Jesus, but if I'm honest, if I look at my life right now, I know I'm not living the life I should be living. And here's the thing. Maybe there's been loss. Maybe there's been trauma. Maybe there's been bad mistakes. Maybe there's been drugs, sex. There's been all type of stuff that, that is, that you say, you know, I feel like maybe I'm stuck. I feel like I'm just lost. I feel like, man, I've, I've messed up so bad. God didn't want to have anything to do with me, and nothing could be further from the truth. God loves every single one of us with a never-failing, undying love. And if you sit and say, you know what, I'm tired of trying to go this on my own and I need to come back to God, now is the time to do that. I often use an analogy of a GPS, whereas if you're driving in your car and the GPS says, hey, go for it for two miles, because you're driving the car, you can choose to go in a different direction, take an exit ramp, do something different. Uh, uh, but ultimately, the GPS doesn't yell at you when you make bad turns, right? It simply recalculates based on where you are to try to chart you a course to get back to where you need to go. And I believe that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do with us. Holy Spirit's like, look, let's get you back to where you need to go based on where you are now. And if you say, Pastor, I, that, that is what I need. I need to recommit and rededicate myself to the things of God to get back to where I need to go. Then now's the time to make that decision. In a moment when we stand and we're singing and it's time to come down, if you need to rededicate, that's what we're talking about. Recommitting and rededicating yourself to the things of God so you can go forward. There's no reason, there's no reason uh, finding yourself and spending the rest of your time in your life stuck. Jesus didn't die for you to stay stuck. Third is the area of prayer. If you need prayer for anything, we would love, love, love to be able to pray with you and pray for you. Uh, don't leave this place needing prayer and saying, oh, well, I didn't want to. Come on, if you need prayer, we'd love to pray with you. It's a privilege for us to do so. And last and certainly not least is membership. If God's called you to be a part of this church, here's what you should know. One, no matter who's up here, Sunday, Wednesday, discipleship, whenever we do stuff, uh, we strive to teach the Word of God in a simple and uncomplicated way so you can understand it and then go live it. Second, we, uh, <laughs> we get busy in our community because that's what we believe the Bible tells us to do. And third, and, and it's like one of my favorites, is the fact that we are a church made up of people from different backgrounds, different stories, different walks, and, and we've all come to this place because we feel like this is where God has called us to be. We don't always agree. Uh, we sometimes have to forgive and apologize and all of that stuff. But you know what we're doing? We're going to come here and we're committed to say, hey, I'm going to bring my gifts and my talents and let God put us all together and use us in ways that he sees fit. And if you sit and say, you know what, I can be a part of that. We would love to have you. So four things. One, if you need to get saved. Two, if you need to rededicate. Three, if you say, man, I need prayer for something, whether it's seemingly small or large, we'd love to pray for you. And four, is if you need to, if, you, if God's called you to be a part of this church, we would love to have you. So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you, if you're able to stand, can you stand right where you are right now? We bow our eyes. We bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh Lord, we cast down our idols. So give us clean hands. Give us.
Let's 